Hey, welcome back to Dance Chess Lounge, everyone. You know, I hope everyone is safe and healthy during this pandemic. Uh, it's been a while since I've posted, but I wanted to come back and drop another video for you guys. Uh, I'm going to be working out of the Bobby Fischer Rediscovered book by Andy Soltis. Uh, when I think about Bobby Fischer, I, I just automatically think greatest American chess player to ever live and you know his games was so exciting you know to to watch and to cover so uh i'm going to be covering you know more games you know from bobby fisher so be on the lookout for that uh the game that i have for you today is a part of his first u.s championship that he played in uh back in 1957 and 58 uh, this game here, uh, he was only 14 years old. Uh, he played against a guy named Sidney Bernstein. And Bernstein was a, a pretty solid chess player. Um, he played out of New York City. And he played in eight U.S. championships uh, in his career. And he had some notable wins against the likes of Frank Marshall, um, Donald Byrne, and also he beat Samuel... Rashevsky, which was also a, a young prodigy, you know, that came up in the New York area. So Bernstein was a formidable opponent for the young Bobby Fischer uh, during his first U.S. championship. Let's see how the game unfolded. Bernstein was white. Fischer was black. So he started off with E4 c5 so we have a sicilian defense right away that's good because sicilian defenses are known to be a a testy and challenging opening uh for for white to play against it's going to be very active most of the time you have t6 e4 so we're looking for an open sicilian here that means it's going to be even more active maybe more tactics more flair so we're going to get to see, uh, you know, the best of young Bobby Fischer back in the day. Knight f6. This is a good move here that hits the pawn on e4. And it, it puts a question to, to white right away. You know, how are you going to defend your, your pawn here? White plays knight c3. Protects the pawn. And now you have the well-known A6, which is the start of the Nydorf Sicilian. And, you know, Fischer was, was known for his play on the, the white side of the Sicilian defense, um, where he would, you know, push his H-pawn up the board. And then, you know, usually in the, in the Sicilian dr dragon opening, you know, he would rip open, you know, the king side, the black king side. And then uh, he would sack a few pieces and checkmate would, would quickly follow, you know. And, you know, he kind of coined the phrase sack, sack, mate. So Fisher was a beast from the white side of the Sicilian. Bishop G5. E6. F4. White is building up pressure in, in the center, and he looks like he wants to push on the king's side here. So it's going to be a very exciting game. Maybe we're going to have some, some wing attacks here. Black may push on the wings over here while white pushes over here on the king's side. So it's going to be a very exciting game. Bishop e7, queen f3. So white is looking to castle queen side. He's developing all of his pieces on the queen side here. So he's looking to castle long. Knight bd7. And if we just stop and reassess the position at this point, uh, you see that white has much more space than black. But black's position is solid. You know, and it's not easy to break down the position. You have the long castle. Queen c7. 
and G4. So White is just marching, you know, full force. You know, he's he's storming Black's king side right away. Now, Black plays B5 here, and you know, this is a good time to point out, you know, things about chess fundamentals and chess principles when you can break the rules and when you can't break the rules and um no rule is is set in stone so to speak right because if you look at the position black has yet to castle and you know we all learn early on that you know what you want to do is develop your pieces in castle right but you you see that fisher has not castled and it's for a good reason um if he does castle right now, you know, he would be castling right into White's attack, basically. He could he could probably get away with it. It's gonna but he's gonna maybe suffer. He's gonna suffer and endure uh an attack. And why why would you just willingly go into that just to follow the quote unquote chess fundamentals or chess principles? You know, you have to play the position that's actually on the board you know if he would have castled you know white would simply sidestep his bishop and prepare to push his his g pawn and basically break open black's king side you know white would have you know a rook right there on the g file you know black would be under some serious pressure you know if he would have castled into that so there was no need to do anything like that so that's why Black opted for b5 instead. He's striking out on the queen side. And, you know, he's following he's following his plan. Bishop g2. This is a good move here. You can see the battery here. Hitting the rook. Bishop b7. It stops that. Um, it stops the threat of, you know, e5. Once white plays e5 there, uh, the queen and bishop battery would have hit the rook. You have rook h e1, b4. So as menacing as white's position looks, because it looks pretty dominant, right? When you look at it with all the space that he has, his, he's castled, he has his rooks in the center of the boar, he's got the battery. Um, it looks pretty dangerous for black, but is it really? Black is actually striking out first after all of that. Knight d5. So this is a critical moment early on in the game here. Um, Bernstein, you know, wants to start the tactics early. And, but if you think about Fisher, Fisher was a beast when it came to his tactical vision and his calculation. Um, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Knight D5, as strange as it looks, because it's, it's under attack. He moved his piece into a, a, a square that's under control by black. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this is a known sacrifice in the Sicilian, especially when black has a pawn on the e6 square. So it looks very, very dangerous, you know, for black, especially with his king being un uncastled and still on the e file. And then you also still have white's rook here pointing right down that file as well. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens here. Let's let's go through this. So if Bobby Fisher does not accept the sacrifice, if he just plays, let's say, knight takes d, right? Knight takes back. Bishop captures, threatening to capture the queen here on f3. Now, white would have this surprising move. Queen captures bishop, giving up his queen, right? But then white would be able to apply some serious pressure. Rook captures bishop there. Then you have 
bishop captures d5. So white gave up his queen, but he has a crushing attack. The bishop is hitting the rook on a8, and the bishop is also hitting um, the bishop and the rook is also hitting the the square on f7 there. You know, you got the dark square bishop on g5. You know, knight, white's knight is ready to jump into the attack as well. It's just an awful position for black. Black would be lost here. So knight captures is not a very good move to make. So that means that Bobby really, you know, has to go in for this sacrifice. He has to accept it really. So, and that's what he does. He takes it. He takes D. Now you have, you know, white opening up the E file. You know, white would, let's think about white's plans here. White would love to double up the rooks on the E file. And he would like to play knight F5. So you would have the knight and the rooks hitting the bishop there on E7. The king is, you know, exposed and vulnerable in the center of the board. This would be a a dream position for for white um black plays king f8 sidestepping it and getting out of the way of the open file there the open e file that's a good move there knight f5 so you have the rook and the knight hitting the bishop so what does black do he protects it Rook e8. Now white is piling on more. He puts his queen on the file. So now you have three attackers, you know, all on the bishop there. That's protected twice. Black moves the bishop out of the way. Could have played queen uh, d8, but a better move here is bishop d d8. The queen moves out of the way. Um, although Black's B pawn is hanging here, uh, White really would would love to move the dark square bishop out of the way and crash through here on the on the king side. That's really what White would like to do: smash open that king side. Bishop c8 is an interesting move here because the bishop wasn't really doing anything on b7. It was kind of, as they say, biting on granite. It was just biting on this d5 pawn here that wasn't doing anything but, um, you know, creating like a blockade really for the bishop. So Fisher moved the bishop to c8 where it can be on a more active diagonal here. And maybe come in and play some defense or may even play some offense at some point. So that was a good uh, maneuvering move there. Bishop h4. So white's plan is clear. He wants to go ahead and move his bishop out the way. And he wants to push his pawns, get his pawns going and, and try to crack open the king side. Knight c5. Fisher realizes that White's knight is posted up in a powerful position. Uh, that's a that's a good knight there. It's just hovering over Black's king side. Um, if you were White here, if you were Bernstein here, how would you continue White's attack? Go ahead and pause the video right here, and let me know how would you continue the attack right here. Okay, hopefully you, you paused the video and picked out a move, or if you just want to enjoy. Bernstein decided to play Knight takes G7. Yes. Knight takes G7. This guy just does not like his knights, does he? First he sacrificed his first knight on D5, and, and now he's sacrificing his other knight on, on G7. So this guy is not afraid to play, you know, tactical you know, and get the calculations going. I, I like that about Bernstein. But is it going to work out? Is it just hope chess or is it going to really work out? You know, he's determined to bust open Black's king side, uh, you know, at the at the cost of some material. But what happens? Let's see what happens here.
So Fisher responds here with King captures knight. So what has happened here? You know, Bernstein sacked his knight and busted open Fisher's king side. Fisher obliged and captured. Um, now you also have the queen and the bishop here, you know, on the knight. So he plays g5 and, you know, white is capitalizing, you know, on that pin there, on that pin knight. And he's looking to get one of his sacrificed knights back. You know, plus Fisher's king is exposed now, you know, along that open, well, soon to be open G file. Bishop F5. Now, this is a beautiful move here. You know, this is a very, very, you know, sneaky move here. Or maybe it's not even sneaky because, you know, it's just a really cool move here. It's playing defense first off because the bishop can drop back on g6 and provide a little bit of cover, you know, for Fisher. But it's also attacking that c2 square. And, you know, there's a deadly combination here. You know, if black can get in knight b3, check. You know, followed by queen capture c2, checkmate. You know, so that would be a very, very sneaky try here. G takes f6, so he gets one of his knights back, check. The king is on h6, and this was kind of the point of, of White's, you know, attack here, was to flush the king, you know, out of the pocket or out of the hole, so to speak. And, you know, with his army, his, his bishop pair and his rooks and queen, you know, hopefully he can mount some type of attack that will checkmate. So, Fisher played queen c4 here, and this kind of stops the whole knight b3 check combination. But let's just say for giggles, laughs and giggles here, if, um, if we would have played rook takes e8, for example, then you get this beautiful knight b3 check, followed by checkmate. So that's just beautiful there. But of course, you know, Fisher's not going to, fall for anything like that so he plays queen c4 and knight d7 here fisher is offering a queen trade and believe it or not bernstein actually accepts and he plays queen takes queen you know and you know white i guess white kind of tapped out you know he was feeling the heat from maybe those sneaky little combinations or something but usually if you're down material like white is then you want to keep the queens on the board so it can help you it can help you with a comeback or with an attack you may be down the material but with the queen you know anything can happen to the last minute you may get a last minute combination or attack so uh, i'm not really sure why he would trade queens there after sacrificing you know both of his his knights really so if we just step back and reassess the position here you know black has an extra pawn right and he has an extra knight and what does white have to show for that he has two extra pawns right so he's got seven pawns to Black's five pawns, right? Both sides' pawn structure is a complete mess. You know, you've got pawn islands, you know, here, 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 here. You know, you got these three, this, this island here. These are hanging pawns here, you know. Um, pawn islands, pawn islands, pawn island. You know, it's both pawn structures are a complete mess <laughs> but um 
Black is uh, material, though. So that's what he has to show for it. And, you know, White's extra pawns that he has, um, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. But Black gets to enjoy, you know, the benefits of his extra knight immediately right now. So that's why, in my opinion, Black is up here. Black is better here. Bishop f3, bishop d8, that puts pressure on that f6 pawn there, that's only protected by a white's bishop there, so it looks like white may be in more trouble here, bishop g5, and at this point here, um, Andy Soltis did note that white was under some time pressure here, by this point in the game. King G6 and Rook G1. You know, this has been kind of White's whole theme of the game, which is try to flush out the Black King and try to put expose the, the Black King as much as possible. And he's he's doing that. He he's he's kind of going along with his plan of attack, attack, attack. You know, he's he has been able to expose the Black King. The, the question is. Is, does he have enough? Does he have enough to show for it? You know, usually if you do something like this or play this way, you want to keep your, your queens on the board. So this goes back to again, you know, why did he why did he accept the queen trade? Bishop takes f6, you know, he drops another pawn. Bishop h4 check. The king goes back to h6. Bishop captures, so you, you trade more pieces, even though you were you were down material, you trade more pieces again. Rook g5. If White could somehow get his rook over to the h file, his other rook on d1, over to the h file, that would just be awesome for him. Uh, that might be a plan that he can try to make a reality that's about the best that he can hope for though so bishop e4 the rook protects bishop back to g6 which is a good defensive move rook f g1 so there he goes again he he's got a few different tricks up his sleeve he would like to play Maybe f5, you know, at some point, uh, not immediately, but maybe at some point, play f5, um, potentially trapping the bishop there. Um, he's got both rooks on the on the g file. You know, maybe if, if he can swing his rook down and over, that would be that dream scenario that we talked about. So he, he has a few tricks up his sleeve still um he's gotta you know be careful of, of leaving his back rank though you know unprotected um he does have a bishop that can land on d1 right now but um so he's still fighting rook e3 hits the bishop bishop does drop back to d1 knight e4 Uh, the knight e4 hit the rook, and the rook retreated back to g2. And now you have Fisher just solidifying his position. You know, White's attack is fizzling out. You know, all of his pieces is going back to the back ranks. <sighs> you know, this doesn't look too good for White. Looks like, you know, his sacrifices might not be paying off. Bishop e2 a5 now white has to try something so this is like his last minute you know effort he's going to try to push his h pawn to try to loosen up the posi the position rook h3 h5 and fisher just simply captures the h pawn there um he welcomes the trades at this point because he is of material so you know, even though White's plan is to try to break open the position even more and hopefully he can come up on, get lucky basically, Fisher's like, come on, bring it on. Like, I welcome, I welcome your tactics and your trades. So then 
White plays bishop d3. Now he is he's shifting his attention to um, this maneuver where he can capture the knight and then maybe push his pawn through with the help of the rooks escorting the pawn. And Fisher just immediately kills that with bishop g6. Um, rook f1 still trying maybe to go for that play. And then rook f8. So Fisher just stops any plans of, you know, bishop captures knight followed by the, the pawn pushing down the board. King moves, knight f6. And now you have knight captures d5 here. So Bernstein lost another pawn. And if you look at the position here, you know, white has that rook on the e file the open e file and he can also swing the other rook there and double up but he doesn't have anywhere to go on that file you know you have the rook you have black's rook hitting e3 and the knight hitting e3 you have the pawns you know covering squares on that file you have the bishop and the other rook on f8 covering squares on that file so even though white you know, has that file because rooks belong on open files. He doesn't have any squares to, to really go in the file. <laughs> and, and Fisher is attacking the pawn on F4 as well. So Bernstein protects it. And now Fisher's like, I don't care if you have a rook on that file, you know, let's trade then. Rook goes to G1. Rook goes back to e7, king d2, king g7. They're just doing a little maneuvering, just trying to uh, shift their pieces to the best possible positions. Um, the white do really doesn't have a plan at this point. You know, nothing, nothing that he's trying is, is working. Rook f3, and this is where white resigned here. Because he's down a pawn and he's down a knight, and there's just no nothing for him to do. There's no way for him to make progress or any type of improvement. Um, Fisher is just too good for that. He's not going to blow a game that he's up an extra piece and a pawn. Um, there's no immediate blow right here for Fisher, but White would be suffering a very long time, and the h pawn is just going to march up the board and it's going to be escorted by all of black's pieces so it would just be a long suffering death here for for white so he throws in the top the towel here this was a good game for fisher there was a lot of complications in, in it there was some tactical stuff in it bernstein sacked you know both of his knights at at some points in the game, you know it was a good tactical game. You you got to remember Fisher was only fourteen years old here. Um, he's clearly stronger though. He's clearly a stronger player, but still only fourteen years old in his first U.S. championship. So this this was very very impressive by the young Bobby Fisher. So hey guys, tell me what you thought about the game there. Uh, leave any. Your thoughts in the comment section. I would love to see what, what you thought about the game. And don't forget to like and subscribe, guys. I'm going to try to post more videos on a more consistent basis. So help me help the channel grow. I would really appreciate it, guys. Okay, until next time, everybody take care.